evening, everyone. It is so great to see some of you I haven't seen for eight or 10 years. Um, and it feels like old home week, the people I've introduced before. And tonight, I'm really happy to be introducing Laura Foley and Sarah Dickinson Snyder again. But before I get to that, I have an announcement about another poetry gathering we do every month on the second Tuesday. It's a hybrid event. If you don't feel like driving down, you can zoom in. If you feel like coming down, we gather around the table in the um, room behind the circulation desk. We call it Recite, because some people actually memorize their own or other people's poetry to share with the group. Um, it's, it's an ongoing group. It's been going for many, many years, I think around eight years now, but it evolves and changes. And so now it's a little more informal. There's discussion between poems and um, it's a really fun and interesting evening. So I invite you all to come. If you don't want to share a poem, just come and listen. We have people doing that as well. Next one is next Tuesday at 5.30. So welcome, everyone. Um, and thank you to uh, WCA TV for filming this. So it will live in the uh, cloud to share with anyone you wish in the future. Um, as I said tonight, we've got two poets that I get to introduce again. Um, Sarah Dickinson Snyder uh, earned her BA at Bowdoin College and her Master's of Education from Harvard. She's attended Breadloaf Writers Conference and the Bay Area Writing Pro Project at University of California in Berkeley. And after teaching English and heading middle schools for nearly four decades, Sarah is now living in Norwich and focusing on her writing. Now These Three Remain is Sarah's fourth, col fourth collection of poetry, and her poems have been nominated for um, Best of Net and Pushcart Prizes, and the connect her collection, Notes from a Nomad, was nominated for the Massachusetts Book Awards. Laura Foley, currently living in Pomfret, holds graduate degrees in English literature from Col Columbia University. She trained in chaplaincy through the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care, and she volunteers in hospitals and prisons and is a certified uh, Shiri Yoga instructor. Laura is the author of nine poetry collections, her most recent being It's This, um, which was I got wrong in the first round of uh, publicity. Um, her uh, collection, The Glass Tree, won the Forward Book of the Year Award and was a finalist for the New Hampshire Writers Project. Joy Street won the Bisexual Writers Award, and her poems have appeared in numerous journals and magazines all around the globe. And um, for those who I didn't catch up with, I think I caught up with everybody. We are gonna do a little bit of an open mic at the end. If I didn't catch you, you can raise your hand then because there'll be time. And um, the poets have decided to go back and forth. So we're gonna start with Sarah and move on to Laura and go back again. So without further ado, please welcome Sarah. Um, thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, feels like a fall, uh, definitely like a fall evening here. It's beautiful. Um, thank you, Liza, for setting this up. Obviously, it's a lot of work, so th thank you. I forget your name. We Greg. Thank you, Greg, for all the work you're doing and for coming. Is it Christian? Yeah. For coming from the Yankee Bookstore. And thank you to my friend and uh, respected poet, Laura Foley, for reading here this evening with me, and we're both kind of launching our new books, um, so I appreciate your being here. Um, I do wanna do a little disclaimer because I, I think I have offended a couple people in doing some readings of this book because of its focus a little bit on religion, and I, I guess I just wanna say, I hope nothing I say offends what you believe, that being a poet, I just, probably put too much on the page about what I believe. So um, there's my, my effort is not to offend anybody, but to share where I am on my own spiritual journey. Um, I'm gonna start with this poem. This book, by the way, is called Now These Three Remain. And it's from the Corinthians um, quotation. That often you hear at weddings, the passage is Now These Three Remain. Um, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. And um, so the sections are set up in um, faith, 
unfaith, hope, unhope, love, unlove. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read is really a response um, to another poet. I don't know if you guys read William Stafford, but I, I love his work. It's rather enigmatic, but um, I really enjoy it. And um, he wrote a poem called What It Is, and in it, it sounds like your book name, <laughs> um, he talks about the strong thread. The strong thread. Perhaps you know about the strong thread, the one that William Stafford writes about, that holds all your old dreams and your before life and your after life, and the one that feels like breath or the beating cloud of a heart that if you let it go, you might die or fall into a life you don't want. Like the one where you were drawn by nicotine to rummage through ashtrays when no one was looking in search of partially smoked cigarettes. But of course, someone was looking. You, you knew. When you hold on to the strong thread, you unbury yourself. Um, as I said, I'm going to like, there are going to be references to faith and sort of the, the amorphous quality to it, but sort of where, where I fall in that. To follow undisciplined ink or having many things to carry. Think of all the things to save. Those sheets of shirt cardboard, the rabbit rabbits I say aloud to no one, on the first day of every month. The embroidered fabric I found in the night market of Chiang Mai. Pens with thin nibs. What my mind finds like a planet devoted to spinning. That miniature metal sculpture of a woman riding a bicycle, the back flap of her dress curled from imagined wind in Vietnam. Pockets of letters. The tile from Istanbul, symmetrical and filled with hues of blues like my daughter's eyes and her voice in the dark at four years old. I don't want to die alone. And the fact that each kernel of corn is attached to a, to a thread of silk under the husk. Maybe the end will be like diving into a channel with a shore on the other side that we don't know is reachable. Maybe we'll carry what we've saved as we fall into water or become water falling, or at least feel touched by its weight, its glistening, that last breath unribbed. I notice when I <laughs> read these poems that I'm quite equivocal. Um, I'm using a lot of maybes, or perhaps um, it's just a, a, something I've noted about myself. Um, so not a lot of certainty. Um, this poem is called Night Work. And um, it, I, the, it's in the, is it in the love section? I don't know where it is actually. I think it's in the faith section. But um, it really is about what happens to me. I don't know if any of you, all of you, or any of you have trouble sleeping, but I do. So, night work. In the lucid hours of insomnia, I build and multiply images, a whole wall of unsleeping. Feel the stillness of my husband's body against my unspooling. I lift the necklace of marigolds, a gift in Rishikesh. Almost inhale the more dirt than flower scent. Now I'm on our road at dusk, in that echo of one gunshot. It's hunting season, everyone wearing red or orange. Where did that bullet land? Did it sink in living skin? I'm on a mission to dig and dig until the clink of bone, and I find the rhyme of love and blood. It's, it's, those, it's those moments where something like that happens, where I did never realize that love and blood rhymed until the middle of one, <laughs> one night. Um, I know, I know. It felt like a gift. <laughs> um, Industry. Maybe, <laughs> there that is again. 
Uh, maybe I am practicing for some God's commandments. With a chisel and mallet, I tap across a smooth surface of slate to unveil letters, carve words that I can touch. Or maybe I want to be a monk, transcribe the next Bible as I memorize each compartment in the drawers of fonts, align letters upside down onto a composing stick before they are inked and pressed into paper. Maybe we all just want to make something close to sacred while we're here. Once I watched a chipmunk drag some recyclables one at a time into the emptiness of our ravine. With closer inspection, I saw the sun-flecked plastic bottles peeking from a pile he'd camouflaged with leaves. So many trips from our garage to create a glittering. Um, Laura and I were, have been reading each other's collections and we realized that we have some common threads and one of them is definitely insects, <laughs> which is just so weird that we are insects, just things that fly or don't fly. So you'll hear a couple of them from me and definitely some from Laura too. In the butterfly pavilion, one settles on my finger, its wings twinned fans, a lightness before it lifts. What occurs in the chrysalis may be proof enough, the dissolving into a slurry of atoms that spin and surge and turn, an imaginable, an imaginable unfolding into flying that we might soar beyond our slow crawl so close to the earth, move from one kind to a higher kind, find that we are winged. And um, the last one I'm going to read has um, <clears throat> sort of a thematic thing that I has happened to me in writing poetry is sometimes I like enter the voice or the voice of a character or a person enters me. I can't figure out which way it is. But um, the two that are really strong in me are Penelope from the Odyssey. But I love it that that all rhymed too. But, um, <laughs> um, and the other one is Eve from Adam and Eve. Um, and I'll be reading uh, a poem about each of them. But this one brings um, Penelope into the light here. To see the healing. Now that the wildflowers have come up and ferns unfurled in the soft ruffle of new grass, it doesn't look like destruction, but trees were wounded, their stumps and roots a testament to what once stood. I can almost see the stitched leaves and branches when I look up into the open sky. The earth heals itself, and so do we. The burned blister on my knuckle still glistens with something like blood, but new skin is weaving itself together. This small healing makes me believe in a God more than all the hours I spent on a wooden pew where I played hangman with my sister on the back of the Sunday program. And now, to wake up fine, the way the earth pulls off its lid of ice, and lilacs burst their heavy purple lungs, the way a desert can yield a succulent or an armadillo, we can mend. Even the worst diagnosis can be rinsed of almost death. The fear of leaving leaves, hope returns. It's my favorite epic simile in the Odyssey when Penelope first speaks to the old beggar who is Odysseus transformed by Athena to mete out justice. As the snow melts, mountain streams run full, so her white cheeks wetted by these tears. Somehow she knows she is with him. So I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Thank you so much. Um, Liza for setting everything up, and Christian and Greg. Um, and I love being in this space, such a beautiful space. And thank you all for coming. So
so um, it's this, actually, um, it's my 10th collection. <laughs> who's, who's counting? Um, Yes, is that better? Yes. I can't tell because it's the different Mikey system. So, so that's good like that? Thank you for telling me. <clears throat> Radiance. I remember when I stopped not believing in God. It sent me to my knees pleading, hands clasped like a penitent or a medieval saint transported to the modern age struck by my mother's stroke. A litany flowed through me of faintly remembered prayers, growing as I spoke, my knees impervious to hard tile, cramped between sink and bath. Yet, when I opened the door, I feigned no inner change, knew my husband's unknowingness would try to eclipse my newfound light, turn brilliance to a dull watered gray with his dismissive gaze, the planet of his non-belief blocking me from radiating. I didn't wish to rejoin him in the cave where I once found comfort watching shadows dance. It was the start of the end of us, the beginning of my brighter epic. Why she would get up to go look in the mirror. It wasn't the blue gray hazel of her eyes she hadn't noticed since her teens, nor shape of face, color of hair, nor what she looked like to others. Something else compelled her to leave her seat in the middle of history class, to find the restroom mirror, to greet those wide awake eyes and newfound smile, the friend who at 45 had just arrived. So that's, I started writing poetry at 45. So yes, um, butterflies. Octubre. If you saw me driving in this pelting rain, you'd never guess my errand to buy lilies for my butterfly. He'll savor the flower's aroma this cold November day, since wild blooms have faded away. Octubre lives in a screened in cage because I couldn't let him out in last week's snow, could I? He seems content, his feet sticky against the screen, pleased to drink when I uncurl his proboscis with a toothpick, dip it in honey water while he sucks through his trunk-like tongue. I say he because he has two spots like eyes on his hand hind side that indicate boy. Good for our family of two lesbians two bitches, a shepherd and a lab, and 30,000 girl bees who spent the whole autumn dragging the hairy drones out of the hive, killing them, dumping the corpses in a heap out front. I'm just saying it's good to have some masculine energy around here, even if it's just one monarch who hangs upside down all day and sometimes flutters his gorgeous wings. Lost and found. On my sophomore science field trip to the rocky Massachusetts coast, I sat captivated by a tidal pool, a little village of crawling crabs, snails, starfish darting, a sea anemone appearing to sing. I stayed so long I forgot the rising tide, my teachers, classmates waiting on the bus. On the exam, I couldn't calculate the pitch of waves or chemical composition of anything, but I knew how to lose myself in the world of tiny shifting things.
So um, being a grandmother, full tide, <clears throat> we walked downhill to the beach, her hand in mine, small step after small step. She said hi to the doggy on the leash, hi mommy to a woman passing on the street, hi daddy to a bearded man. On the sand, she stared, transfixed at the water, the slight waves, the tide not yet pulling out. She looked up toward a flap of wings. Bird, I said, pointing at the seagull, and she mimicked bird, then turned her gaze back to the waves, slow, slapping. Later, I sat looking at trees below me, a hint of haze burning off the far bay, the world busy working and sailing, waking. While well, I sat waiting as Evie napped that quiet Maine morning, the full tide of grandmotherhood lapping my shore. To see it, we need to separate, to see the life we've made, to leave our house where someone waits patiently, warm, beneath the seats, to don layers of armor, sweater, coat, mittens, scarf, to stride down the frozen road, putting distance between us this cold winter morning, to look back and see on the hilltop our life lit from inside. Breakfast conversation. I've placed her favorites, fresh raspberries, string cheese, a glass of milk in the giraffe cup on her high chair tray. As she munches away, swinging her short legs, she asks thoughtfully, Grandma, are you pooping? <laughs> I continue my bite of oatmeal, take a sip of coffee, respond, no, darling, how about you? <laughs> She isn't either, and we both wonder what to say next. <laughs> <laughs> then, the human world kicks you in the head again and again, so you must seek beyond the no. The song of dried beech leaves ringing in the brittle wind, a hollow tone to shiver you like a tuning fork, so the healing bell inside yourself will, will resound in quietness with yes, and yes, and yes. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Before the currents in my blood began to make another and let her grow, before the pond was dug and filled by springs, before my parents' ashes lined its basin, before I loved the smoothness of red wine, before Shirley embroidered the wedding cloth, before we'd mapped the world with footprints and jet trails, before the large scars on my knees, before looking out this window, framing tree and green, I swam in a congregation of rivers, moved through sadness with a stomping, unbuttoned and buttoned soft shirts. And I knew when to say, no, I am not ready, no. I have a different life to live. How I sheltered myself inside myself and walked down the hard cement steps of a Planned Parenthood building, bleeding, yes, but knowing that the blood would stop and my life would open. Call it 1980. Call it my call. <laughs> Thank you. It's a scary poem to read right now. Uh, um, you heard some of the traveling 
that I do with the, in one of the poems, and now I'm going to read a couple that deal with it quite directly, but my husband and I, Ben and I, are so fortunate and lucky to be able to travel around the world. We take students from the school where we both taught probably 17 to 20 trips, um, all different places of the world, and trying to open eyes and do some service work and that kind of stuff. So when I, as a poet, I'm, I bring a journal and just write, 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 just details of, and then when I come home, I can kind of concoct and look at it and create maybe something out of it. So these next two are, are part of that. And the first one, um, Traveling, has an epigraph by Lucille Clifton. Um, probably, I would say, this is a bold, but it, could, it is my favorite poem. I'm just going to say that. Um, <laughs> it's called Blessing the Boats, and it's a just a, a beautiful poem about literally blessing boats as they go into the Chesapeake. But it, to me, it's much more about blessing um, the, a person you love as they leave this world in death. Um, and the last line is, and may you and your innocence travel through this to that. One other thing, I am so scared of flying. <laughs> so that's part of, I love to travel, but that I have definitely have a fear of flying. Traveling, prepare for landing, and finally I breathe. So frightened I am in the sky, that long, long arrow of fear above the clouds, the mercy of new words for life and death, from this to that. This, the dizzy, spinning earth. Luang Prabang is no longer a dot on a map when I arrive in the heat on the muddy banks of the Mekong. I kneel and bow, my hands lift with rice and fruit for the monks, I see the hems of orange folds and hear the papery skin of their feet on the narrow street. I sit in a jeep so close to seven lions eating the belly of a giraffe, their open mouths bloody caves. The South African guide in front, his gun glinting on the dashboard. The quilt of rice patties I bicycle along and the Vietnamese bus driver who picks a white flower on the roadside to slip behind my ear. In Rwanda, the smell of red dirt, dried fish, battered metal, and the strange architecture of forgiveness. All this. This afternoon, I trapped a buzzing fly between the window and screen. I woke that night, moved down the dark stairs, lifted the window. No that what is done can sometimes be undone. And um, this one is, there are a couple words in here that I, I stole from a poet that I love, um, another poet I love, Ross Gay. So, inhabiting an ant after Ross Gay. The hunger of it, the grip, even when it is upside down, the smallness, the finding of an opening in a box of sugar, that endless sweetness. And in this way, I feel fine when it slips unhit into darkness between the counter and stove. And in this way, we survive side by side, my hand silenced as I watch another find its way up the steep wall of the smooth ceramic sink, climb with an ease I wanted in Patagonia, my backpack snug against my body, my poles a part of my arms, scaling rocky inclines, moving in unimaginable beauty, so far from this kitchen, in unbroken land, skirting turquoise lakes, under clouds collecting like a partition above, wind everywhere. Um, the, the other person, as I said, that I inhabit is Eve, and it's just weird. <laughs> she came to me about two years ago, and she just will not leave. Um, you know, she's just always entering in my life. And this was the first poem I wrote from her point of view, and the others have just come like a, a rush of water, which has been uh, one of the most amazing things for me as a writer, to get to talk through her, with her, in her. 
when God listens to Eve. It's hard to be the beginning, the one pulled from a cage of ribs without the sweet smell of milk or symbiosis of skin. That's probably why he and I began our cleaving, arriving already long-limbed and flat-bellied. The only sanity would be to sleep next to him, to find and reach to spaces in our darknesses under the stars, both of us motherless. I wander on the spongy soil where there's too much to harvest, every tree humming with wind and bird sound, ferns unfurled and generous, and those leafy walls of scent, lilac, jasmine, and their shadows. All the furred and winged animals seem indifferent and ornamental. I count the loud crows without number, follow their spiriting from branch to sky, and when I look beyond to the changing moon, barely there in blueness, I am surrounded and uncertain. I need to know the world of same that comes from same. A seed begets a tree, a tree its fruit. Every stone stays in the perfect place, except the small, smooth ones I pick up. Maker, the next time you want to make yourself into flesh and blood again, place us in a mother. Let us collapse into her arms and know the watermark of a child's tears from birth. Yeah, she's pretty angry. Um, and then um, I'm going to read a few poems about the deal with my husband back there, my biggest supporter, Ben. Um, the first one is <laughs> giving thanks. Um, these are definitely in the love section. Um, <clears throat> I, I hope there's a little bit of humor in what I read sometimes, but maybe I don't know, but I hope there is some humor in this. Um, I'm, not as, I'm not as funny as Deb, for sure. <laughs> okay, giving thanks. This morning, I woke, I woke in gratitude, actually said aloud, thank you, Ambien, Mom, Dad, and God, just in case. My husband was already stretching and exercising after checking for limp-tailed prostrate mounds of fur in the traps he'd set the night before and takes them to a place I only imagine, a sad scatter of tiny skeletons. I will let a mouse scurry on the floors and in drawers long before I'll pick up that small quietness and wing it into woods. Not all death I avoid. As a hospice volunteer, I have felt the last beat of more than one heart, touched stilled skin that lacquers as it leaves, believe that death and birth share a world. I should thank him first, before the relief of sleep, before my dead parents, before a deity I do not know. He is the person who saved a different me, more swelled with need, not exactly like the helicopter that lifted the lobster man from Montauk after hours of treading dark water with only a small buoy, but like that. <laughs> um, and this is a poem that, I have just two more. Um, this is a poem that I had to, I had to um, really champion because my editor um, of the, of the, my publisher, the editor there, wanted to get rid of it. And I, I let her get rid of several of them and added more, but she, she really wanted to take this one out. And I was like, no, you can't take that one out. And she was like, why do you care about this one so much? And I, was, I said, well, I think it's what I believe God is. And she goes, well, then call it God. <laughs> so it was a different title, and I just decided to call it God. And she let me keep it. <laughs> God. That vibration in the space between me and someone I love or don't love or don't even know, like a stranger sitting next to me on a plane and we find we have the same book and I tell her a secret I've never told anyone. And when I take my bag from overhead and walk on earth again, she stays as if my blood and bones feel her. 
and it's the pulsing between me and my children, one in the beginning, a shared skin, the divine etched in. But even when they grow and leave and return, the shine of their hair is in my palm, and when we embrace, I breathe them in. And with you, my love, that shuddering, shimmering, how impossible and luminous over decades, an invisible fire. And the last poem I was going to read is my last poem in the book. And it's just so funny. Laura and I have the same um, thing. It, the end of her book is a poem that has nine sections. And the end of my book has a poem with nine sections. They're, they're small, so don't, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. This isn't going to last very long. OK. <laughs> um, in Search Of. One. As if we were all small owls clutching a branch in a world turned sideways, our trees severed and moving on a truck heading to some city in December. Two, I hold the trolls I loved, their long colorful hair, the larger half of a wishbone with a wish, and the Archie comic book I read over and over, a life I wanted in its thin pages. Three, how easily the leaves give into wind, but not to falling. Some stubborn ones rattle all winter, so tight the bond. None of us should drown. Four, move under the shadows of the unpeeled leaves of an artichoke to find the generous heart. Five, crouched in the barn under a roof, sagging into a rusted car, the upright but broken wooden wheelchair, a filing cabinet with one drawer pulled out as if someone might return. Six, remember the smooth pennies you pulled from the train track, thin and warm with near death. Seven, and Rilke, who told a young poet to dive into aloneness. Eight, Think of the waterfall, not just the roar, but the pool below, the one that encased the fawn who either slipped or leapt from the edge. Nine, find what you coil inside. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah, it's, um, it's been really fun. I feel like you know, we're kind of going on the road doing our... <laughs> um, on the way. A soft spring morning, tender rain after a violent night of house-shaking winds, loud belts of thunder. As I stride to my car with backpack, yoga mat, snacks, my wife calls to me from our bedroom's second floor window. She must have removed the screen. She leans out, calling in love and friendliness. And it occurs to me, I finally have what I wanted all my life as I smile back on the way to my day. Alternative reality. The two-year-old, oh, I'm just going to preface this. Um, Imogene asked me just yesterday what I like about being a grandmother. And, um, and what I didn't say, I, I thought about it later, I just, love, I just love seeing how they learn and relate to the world as they grow. I, I think it's fascinating. Alternative reality. The two-year-old resists my hand, walks on her own down the steep drive, kicks a lump of snow she calls rock. At the bottom of the hill, Christmas waits in sacks, bright wrapper and ribbon just visible through black plastic, cardboard waving from the recycling bin in December wind. A truck rumbles up just in time for us and she calls happily to Santa Claus. 
who jumps out and waves back as he loads the trash into his noisy sleigh. In white beard, ski cap, fluorescent green vest, I can see what she has seen in him and how he now begins to see himself as he ho-ho-hos down the road, red taillights twinkling, engine thundering as he grinds the gears like a hundred reindeer. <clears throat> so a poem about Mary Oliver, and I, I wrote this um, on learning of her when she died. Uh, it's just sort of, the whole poem just arrived like this. Um, and a lot of it are quotes from her poems that I just know. It matters that Mary Oliver woke early as, and walked along the bay as morning sun tore the sheets of darkness from the sky. It matters that she carried a notebook and cared to look into a kingfisher's soul, to dig in wet sand for clams in which she later tasted the salt sea erupting in her mouth like sex, that she let the soft body of the soft body of her body love what it loved, which was Molly. It matters that she loved a woman. It matters that we each wake to stride our own snow dunes, finding in each day something of value, even the last ash leaf hanging on a winter limb, shivering a bit, then falling into stillness over and over to lose ourselves into something larger, something better. It matters that I clutch my stack of her books, those fields of light, now that her body has gone into the cottage of darkness. An Ordinary Sunday. On Sunday, I sing in a church choir, not believing in God, but holding a space for something. Some might call it spirit, an opening, a candle illuminating a cave. On Sunday, I climb the hill behind our house as the long winter thaws and my dogs dig in wet loam. I wait for worries to relax their hold for my mind to become one with the clouds calm drifting, the trilling of a stream rushing somewhere unseen. We need, I think, to let ourselves soften around hurt before we melt like spring snow into fields. So I let dad in, decades past his death, find a few good memories like stones just soft enough for polishing, him filling the green glass vaporizer nightly so I wouldn't get sick in my childhood winter's hot, dry air, dad donning an apron to cook for his skinny teen. I breathe in the care and nourishment he offered then, and I receive today on an ordinary Sunday. So I'll read two more poems. Um, symbiosis. So Evelyn and Evie are the same person. Symbiosis. Evelyn and I climb the hill in crisp sunrise. I lift an oak leaf from the ground crusted with first frost. She touches like fairy dust and pockets to show her dad. We rest at a picnic spot on wooden chairs, close our eyes in meditation. Listen, I say, to the sounds you hear with closed eyes. Fallen leaves crinkling in autumn's morning breeze, blackbirds squawking unseen, somewhere in the high pines, wind shuffle, shuffling through hemlocks. And she asserts in her high, thin, toddler voice, clear and glad as a cardinal's trilling, the chairs, listen to the chairs. And we do, side by side, with eyes closed, instructing each other. <laughs> and 
another time I, I suggested we um, stop and smell the flowers, and she said, let's smell the leaves. <laughs> you know, like, great. Uh, so one more poem, and this, it's the nine, the nine part poem, which um, I think a lot of our poetry speaks to each other, poems speak to each other. And uh, this is nine small parts, and I will not do the numbers, so you'll just know that they're coming. <laughs> nine ways of looking at light. We move the bed so the head faces north, a wisdom we read from India. We dislodged a ghost, her husband, who on these sheets some years ago expired. We altered the angle of our repose and sleep all night at peace entwined. We wake to morning hills, trees, a great expanse, a gentle dappled light new to us. The patient avoids the hospital window's view, turning from snow's glare and striped winter trees, focusing on photos of dogs, children, his hunting awards taped to the wall, all invoking home where he'd prefer to be. This large man with his bright white beard who doesn't read much, doesn't pray, except now with me, both of us shy, until his eyes tear and his body shines from inside. No dappling leaves, but enough snow on near branches now to illuminate our window. Winter light grown greater with snow's reflection. We begin it with experiment, hurling boiling water to the frozen air, watching it glitter like glass confetti crackling in the new year an answered wish in every shining shard. Cold wind whips snow, so it swirls around our tallest pine, a halo of light circling a frigid angel or ghost from my or someone else's past, seeking company or just floating in the crisp winter air for the wonder of it. Not brown, not rust, but inexplicably white as bones. These remnants, dry as dust, recall life crackling as wind shivers them in barren early spring. Not one bud yet gracing it. White leaves clung through snow and ice to shine and tremble in this Sunday light. The dog shivers, wet from a late spring swim whimpers as the wind pulls light from the pond. And we sit in shadows by the water she knows just last summer shone gold. This sip of coffee over so quickly, this guiding lighthouse in the mistless harbor, moments before the season changes, this slip of wind along the bay, a sweater saving me from chill, this precious slant of summer sun, clouds arriving to veil the light, a gentle voice of waves on stone, it's this, it's this, it's this. I walk this foggy dawn to see the seals, where they sleep beneath the scrim rain makes of rising light to hear the music of their steady breath, a holy time before the changing of the tide. Thank you for listening.
adjust it to your height, not mine. <laughs> I wonder where that is. How does that sound? Oh, all right. How about this? Better, better a little bit. Closer. Closer. Yeah. Good. Is that good? <laughs> you didn't have all this trouble. How is that? Will it do at least? I don't want to bore you with this. How is it really? Is it good enough? Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is supposed to be this is supposed to be really brief. I mean, it's just sort of an addendum, right? Um, so I'll keep it that way, uh, and with um, a slight introduction, because um, it just so happens, and it's probably because I'm getting really quite old that I've been losing quite a number of people and I'm with quite a number of people who have lost people really dear to them lately, in the last year particularly, two years. And I've been writing about that, thinking about that, dwelling upon that rather a lot. Um, um, so that's where I'm coming from in just three parts of a longer poem that, that um, make me think about those things. And it involves people really dear to me, not so much the loss as the appreciation more than one tends to give them until you realize you could lose them. Yeah? And the first part refers to my dad. Tea in a flask he'd take, milk in and sugar, biscuits, just plain ones, rectangular with edges crimped. I'd jump in the back seat, smiling. She'd have on a floral skirt to her calves, a pale jumper, no good for mud, her shoes were ladylike and strappy. If the wind was brisk, she'd sit in the car. He, though, would grasp my hand and grin. Out the doors, off across the sheep-worn grass, navigating bracken lanes, dodging prickly gorse. Seemed the skylarks were singing their hearts out. Only his eyes would point out rabbit trails and pheasant cover. Together we'd take a breath as we breached the skyline and scanned in renewed amazement the silver of the bay. Downward we'd plunge at a run, sheep scattering, a chosen outcrop now in sight, chalk white against the green. Reaching it, we'd perch breathless and grin. Ahead, we'd see the circle. His face would now turn solemn. His mossy tweed and earthen worsted seamlessly scaped the land. Slowly and in silence, we approached the storm, stones. My dad, the druid. Um, and how lucky I've been, as I say, appreciating even more than I ever have my good fortune in this life. On the stairs. I, I first met him coming down the stairs. His hand rested lightly on the polished banister as he hesitated there to let me by. A worn old staircase, a house with a long London history, now turned into flats. I didn't look my best, tired at the end of a long day, coming in bedraggled by the gray rain, October chill, damp leaves piled in the gutters. At nose level, I faced his bare brown chest. He so tall, thin, and beautiful. All he wore was a big brown hand-knitted cardigan open wide. 
and a pair of American Levi's, bare feet like no one I'd ever seen. I tilted up my chin and met his piercing gray eyes, saw his straight white orthodontured teeth. His hair seemed bleached by a faraway sun. Who is he? Where has he come from? What is he doing here? And the last part, anniversary. Other women wanted roses, the cloying stickiness of chocolates, the promises, the amnesia. At puberty, their mothers had injected them with fear serum, with a guaranteed desire to disappear. They drank long drafts of smile with evenly spaced teeth. They pared their nails to perfect points. Other women wanted jaguars, chauffeurs even, uniformed men in polite caps and lace-ups, barely settled into menstrual cycles. They'd listed the right schools for two or four offspring, weighed the limits of their expectations for envied invitations. Was it neglect that caught me unawares? Did my mother's indulgence release me? Or in life's lottery, did I just luck out? Jump on a ticket to ride to the moon and back, land in the lap of a centaur from Minnesota. Place your bets, ladies and gents. Is this one a long shot or what? Can a ride last half a century? Can the moon trolley shoot over and over, the rush not diminish, the laughter not fade. What is this compensation for exile, this joining deep in the bone? What can ever be sufficient gratitude? Thank you. Last minute contributions. Okay, so with, sorry about that. Without further ado, I did forget to mention that, um, which was horrible of me because having been in Christian shoes for almost 30 years, I should never forget. There are books um, available at the back, and I'm sure our two presenters will be more than happy to autograph them for you. And um, there's cookies and uh, refreshment on the, the sideboard there. So. Um, uh, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I would love to see some of you next Tuesday at the open mic uh, recite evening. So without further ado, thanks so much. Thank